coming up in today's newscast. Israel offers thanks as officials bid farewell to IDF Chief of Staff Gadi Eisenkot. Former IDF Chief Benny Gantz says he'll work to reform the controversial nation-state law. And Israel's first pod hostel opens in Tel Aviv in time for Eurovision 2019. Outgoing IDF Chief of Staff Gadi Eisenkot told Army Radio this morning that the IDF has found all Hezbana tunnels infiltrating into Israel's territory. Eisenkot said that finding the sixth and last tunnel yesterday was done by chance and that it could have just as easily been uncovered in a week or two. Eisenkot praised the IDF's Operation Northern Shield to locate and destroy the Hezbollah cross-border tunnels from Lebanon and said it was a success, though he added that Israel would not cross into Lebanon territory to destroy all the tunnels from the other side, instead relying on its cooperation with UNIFIL to prevent further threats. With regards to Israel's operations in Syria, Eisenkot said that despite his comments to the New York Times about Israel hitting thousands of Iranian targets in the country, and despite Netanyahu's comments in the weekly cabinet meeting claiming responsibility for this weekend's attack in Syria, he stressed that it is important to maintain ambiguity regarding Israel's actions against Iranian consolidation in Syria. With regards to the southern border, Eisenkot said that Gaza still remains a serious threat, but one that is under control by Israel's security forces. He said that the main challenge was to maintain the calm and reinstate the feeling of security for Gaza border communities. These are sentiments that Public Security Minister Gilad Erdan also addressed in an interview to Army Radio today. He said that Israel did not stop its actions in Gaza for one moment despite addressing the northern threat, and stressed that our goal is to maintain the quiet. Erdan, however, warned that Hamas should know that we are not deterred from launching a massive offensive, even including a ground offensive. But he clarified that this is not something that Israel is actively seeking, stressing that we simply want quiet in Gaza for the residents in the southern border communities. On Sunday night, Israel's upper political and security echelon bid farewell to outgoing IDF Chief of Staff Gadi Eisenkot. In a speech, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu praised Eisenkot for defending Israel on four fronts during his tenure and said, quote, Gadi, under your command, major work has been done in the IDF, but major work also remains, end quote. לא יהיה לך יום אחד של חסד, תאמין לי את זה אני אומר מניסיון אישי. ואמרתי לך, המזרח התיכון מתפרק, מדינות קורסות, ולתוך החלל הזה שועטת איראן שמנסה ללפות אותנו בזרועותיה הרצחניות. הוספתי את המסקנה המתבקשת שאני יודע שאתה מזדהה איתה. במזרח התיכון אין רחמים לחלשים, רק החזקים שורדים. נתניהו אמר שאיזנקוט פוקס את שלוש שנים רבות לחלוטין את ישראל's main enemy, איראן. האיום הגדול ביותר על ביטחוננו בא ממשטר האייתולות באיראן, שחרת על דגלו את השמדתנו. לצורך זה הוא חותר לפתח נשק גרעיני, נשק מדויק ונשק סייבר. לצורך זה הוא בנה נגדנו מעוז קדמי בלבנון, ועכשיו הוא מנסה גם לבנות מעוז נוסף בסוריה, והפעם מצווה איראן. Netanyahu said that together they acted to complete four main missions, to block Iran's efforts to gain nuclear weapons and reintroduce sanctions, to block Iran's military buildup in Syria, to prevent Hezbollah from attaining precision missiles, and to deprive Hezbollah and Hamas of the tunnel's weapons. Netanyahu added that the citizens of Israel know of only a small fraction of the hundreds of daring missions the IDF has undertaken to keep Israel's borders safe. Turning to his replacement, Netanyahu quipped, I want to promise you, also you won't have one day of grace, but we trust you. In the name of Israel, I am Speaking Monday morning, former IDF Chief of Staff Benny Gantz made his first political statements to the world, following the creation of his Hosen Israel or Israel Resilience Party last month. And if elected to Parliament, it seems like his first order of business will be to, quote, do everything in his power to fix the controversial nation-state law. Well, joining us now with more is journalist and Israeli media personality Gad Harel. 
So, God, what do you make of Gantz's comments? Well, I think he's uh, starting. He's a little, uh, he's still a little confused what to do, I think. But uh, his comments are uh, very usual, you know. Uh, we want, uh, we're going to change the law, Chokaleo. So I don't think it's, it says something about him. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily say if he's to the left or to the right? No, I think he's trying to put himself as center, as the mamlachti, as they say in Hebrew. Center, not left, not right. And he's going to, I think his plan is going to be to show how that we, that we can do things differently, not left, not right. It's going to be difficult, but he's going to give it a try. I think he has good, uh, he's starting to get good uh, advisors. So he hasn't said enough yet for us to really know. No, we don't know nothing. He's, he's like the new kid on the block, but we don't know nothing. We don't know what he's going to do. We don't know what he's going to think. We just, all, all of us, all the people that uh, think, uh, talk about this, they, they're just... Um, do they think, don't know they're in the, in the air, as they say. Do you think this might be on purpose, sort of a political strategy? About guns, you're talking? Yeah, about guns. No, I don't think it's a strategy. I think he's, um, he's looking for his way. He doesn't know still what to do. It could be a strategy, but it's not, uh, we don't know. He might get uh, together with other parties. He's trying. He, he might go alone. We're, as they say, uh, in the air. Mm -hmm. Now back to his comments, I mean, does yes. he have any actions or history that can actually back this up? Oh, yeah, I think he, you know, with the Druze, he, he, he served with a lot of those people in the mm -hmm. army, so he has some commitment to them. And maybe he feels that Chokalev is not right, so mm -hmm. uh, that's what he said. But already, you know, from the, from the right, they say it shows that he's left. Uh, some commentators said uh, you can see that he's, he's going to be attacked a lot the minute he starts to talk. Yeah. And on the, on the left, he was also attacked that he didn't say to cancel the law, but just to, right, to right. amend it. So, uh, right. So it's not, it's not going to be easy for him. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, can yeah. Benny Gantz actually win the upcoming election? Oh, that depends, as I said, on how he's going to get with who he's going to go. But by himself... I don't see it. I don't see he's going uh, to win, no. Okay, now assuming the Likud yeah, wins, as most right. polls do predict, right. um, do you foresee that Benny Gantz will uh, join a Likud-led coalition? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's in his... Uh, so he comes to change, not to be in the same thing. I don't think. But uh, we can still be surprised, you know, when, if, if, if everybody in the end is going to get together, a lot of people are going to get together, so maybe it will be a surprise, and Bibi will, you know, Bibi has his problems, uh, you know, predictions we saw in America mm -hmm. with Trump and Hillary. Yeah. Yeah, we know the predictions. Now, Lapid and Livni uh, yes. are reportedly talking unity. Right. Um, what are their chances, do you think, should they join? Lapid and Livni by themselves, you mean? No, they're talking about unifying. Yeah, There's right. been reports that they right. might sort of merge into right. one party. Uh, but you're not talking about with guns, right? You're talking them Well, themselves. let's talk first yeah, by themselves first and the, then with guns. Well, yeah. they might, yeah, if they get the unity, it, uh, they're going to be, Lapid is going to get uh, stronger, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they, 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 they but uh, who knows, maybe they'll get together with guns in the end and that will be good for the, for the other side, as they say. So do you think Gantz would be more attracted to joining a Lapid, uh, Lapid Livni coalition? He might, but we still don't know what's his intentions. He's, he's keeping it very, uh, you know, close to the heart. We don't know what's his intentions, but uh, we believe he, he might. He might join that coalition. So, yeah. Yes. What do we know uh, about Gantz at this point? Because we don't, <laughs> we don't know much, but what, what do no, we know? No, that's the point. We don't know. We, don't, we know he's a... He was a good uh, soldier, he was a good army, but you know, in politics it's different. Uh, he, he never jumped to politics, maybe he's a little frightened. Uh, we know that, uh, we don't know any of his ideas, he didn't talk much. We don't know if he's, but we believe that he's uh, more center, you know, as, as I said, not, uh, not really in the right, that's what we believe, but um, we will see, we will see. Great. God, Halal, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, and uh, good luck with your uh, new program here. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.
So U.S. President Donald Trump issued a warning to Turkey on Sunday, economic devastation if he attacks Kurdish forces once the U.S. troops withdraw from Syria. In two tweets Sunday, Trump said that the U.S. was starting the long overdue pullout from Syria while hitting the little remaining ISIS territorial caliphate hard and from many directions, adding that the U.S. will attack again from existing nearby base if it reforms. U.S. President Donald Trump issued a warning to Turkey on Sunday, economic devastation if it attacks Kurdish forces once the U.S. troops withdraw from Syria. In two tweets Sunday, Trump said that the U.S. was, quote, starting the long overdue pullout from Syria while hitting the little remaining ISIS territorial caliphate hard and from many directions, end quote, adding that the U.S. will attack again from existing nearby base if it reforms. Trump then turned to Turkey, saying that he would devastate Turkey economically if they hit Kurds, calling on them to create a 20-mile safe zone. Likewise, however, Trump addressed the Kurds, telling them not to provoke Turkey. The U.S. president also addressed Russia, Iran, and Syria, saying that they have been the biggest beneficiaries of the long-term U.S. policy of destroying ISIS in Syria, as they were, quote, natural enemies. He added that the U.S. also benefited, but that it is now time to bring our troops back home, calling to stop the endless wars. Meanwhile, in related news, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is cutting short the rest of his trip in the Middle East to attend a family funeral, a State Department spokesman has said. Pompeo has been on a regional tour aimed at reassuring U.S. allies over the U.S. troop withdrawal from Syria. We want, we want to take that violence level down so that we can begin to return the displaced persons to that region as well. Um, I actually think the president's remarks are, are pretty clear about uh, what America hopes to achieve in these conversations with all of the parties, the Turks certainly included amongst them. The Secretary of State will return home after meetings in Oman instead of traveling on to Kuwait. Meanwhile, on Monday, Pompeo met separately with Saudi Arabia's king and crown prince in Riyadh. The U.S. Embassy in Riyadh tweeted that the leaders discussed the need for a de-escalation in Yemen. Pompeo had also said previously that he would discuss the investigation into the murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. In other news, while the U.S. works to ease its way out of Syria, a new report by the Wall Street Journal reveals that the White House requested at least twice that plans for a military attack on Iran be drafted. The report comes Sunday and details how the Pentagon was tasked with creating these plans after the September attack in Baghdad against the American embassy. The request was initially filed by the National Security Council under advisor John Bolton. And the journal goes on to explain that according to the request, the attack in Iraq was an act of war that begged a severe response. Perhaps more surprising, however, are reports that the Pentagon began but may not have finished these requests, and that President Trump may not have even known about it. That being said, a heavy-handed response to such an attack would be right in line with President Trump's policies. And the report also comes at the heels of Iran's nuclear head. Ali Akbar Salehi telling State TV in Tehran that, quote, preliminary activities for designing modern 20 percent enriched uranium fuel have begun, end quote. And while 20 percent enrichment falls far below the 90 percent threshold required for atomic weapons, this level of enrichment would still be in clear violation of the 2015 GCPOA nuclear agreement signed with Western powers. Now, back in Israel. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu toured the Upper Galilee along the Lebanese border on Sunday, where he again vowed to do whatever was necessary to prevent Iran from gaining a foothold in Syria, including, of course, increasing aerial assaults on Iranian and Iranian proxy targets. למנוע התבססות צבאית של איראן בסוריה, ואם צריך, אנחנו גם נעצים את ההתקפות הללו. במקביל, צה"ל חשף מנהרה שישית שחצתה לתוך שטח ישראל, מנהרה הגדולה מכולן. זה מביא בעצם את מבצע מגן צפוני לסיומו, המוצלח. אנחנו נמשיך לעקוב אחר כל הפעילות של חיזבאללה, של איראן וגורותיה, ונעשה מה שצריך כדי להבטיח את ביטחון ישראל. Now, some have shrugged off these latest comments as just a political game ahead of elections. But others have criticized the Prime Minister for breaking with traditional Israeli policy, i.e. not publicly acknowledging Israeli strikes in Syria in order to avoid unnecessary returns and provocations. Still, most agree with the overall message to prevent Iran from advancing at all costs. That's why it's also likely that Netanyahu, as foreign minister, will accept U.S. Secretary of State Pompeo's invitation to attend an upcoming security summit in Warsaw, Poland. 
It's set for next month, and according to Israeli Channel 10 News, the conference on Iran, organized by the U.S. and Poland, aims to bring together as many foreign players as possible to counter the growing threat. Even many Arab countries, which have no diplomatic ties with Israel, like Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and the UAE, will be in attendance. According to a critical new report released Monday by international watchdog group NGO Monitor, the World Council of Churches is engaging in anti-Semitic rhetoric and in training programs for BDS activism. In fact, NGO Monitor says that the significant problems in this report should be seen in light of the anti-Semitism and demonization that emerges from within the WCC, its partners and affiliated staff. Additionally, several world bodies like UNICEF and the United Nations, as well as Western nations such as the United States, Australia, Germany, Sweden and Norway, are all major donors to the program. The World Council of Churches, or the WCC, represents a fellowship of 350 congregations totaling nearly half a billion Christians worldwide. And for the past 15 years, they've been running one of their most successful programs, the EAPPI, or the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel. Since 2002, the EAPPI has sent over 1,800 volunteers to the West Bank to, quote, witness life under the occupation, end quote. Between 25 to 30 volunteers, or ecumenical accompaniers, live in the area for three months, documenting supposed abuses and, quote, offering protective presence, end quote. But according to the NGO report, by singling out Israel, EAPPI embodies anti-Semitism as defined by the International Holocaust Remembrance Association's working definition. The EAPPI also emphasizes political advocacy and activism, such as engaging in BDS campaigns both before, during, and after the trip. And finally, among other points, NGO Monitor writes that the EAPPI partners with groups that support BDS, deny Israel the right to exist, and accuse Israel of war crimes. It's not all doom and gloom in the report, however, and GeoMonitor offers three recommendations to address these issues. For donor nations to develop and implement transparent funding guidelines that are accountable to the public, that Israel create a policy to deal with delegitimization campaigns, and that the WCC stop promoting an ideology that denies Israel's right to exist as a Jewish nation state. Moving on. The BBC reported Saturday that 95-year-old former Nazi guard Jakiv Palij has passed away in Germany. Palij was the last known Nazi in the United States to be stripped of his American citizenship and deported. Born in 1923, Palij was born in an area of Poland that is today a part of the Ukraine. And in 1941, during the Nazi occupation of Poland, Palij served as an armed guard in the Trauniki concentration camp where Nazi SS troops trained to kill Polish Jews, and where over 12,000 Jews were imprisoned and murdered. But in 1949, just a few years after the war ended, Palij found his way into the United States, where he became a citizen in 1957. He had convinced immigration authorities that he'd simply worked on his father's farm during the war, and it took nearly 50 years of investigations to reveal his true identity in 2004. It was then that his history was finally publicized, and he was ordered to leave the country. Neither Germany, Ukraine, nor Poland would take him, however, leaving his deportation stalled until 2018. Activists never faltered, though, with bipartisan groups of activists and lawmakers continuing to protest Palij's residence in the U.S. Writing in 2017 that Palij being in New York was a painful reminder for Americans who fought against the Nazis or lost loved ones in the Holocaust. Then, finally last year, under President Trump, Germany finally accepted Palij's return. And U.S. Ambassador to Germany, Richard Grinnell, lauded Trump on Twitter, thanking the president for making the deportation a priority, and saying that it was something multiple presidents just talked about, but President Trump made it happen. Well, it happened, indeed, putting an end to this bitter chapter for many. And according to German newspapers and officials, Palij died last Wednesday in an elderly care home in the town of Aachen. Extreme weather conditions in the north are keeping residents and rescue teams both on their toes this week as heavy rains and snowfall completely overwhelm Israel's infrastructure. First, Monday morning, two jeeps with three passengers were swept off of Route 804 and into the Khilazon River, which is again experiencing extreme flash flooding. The Khilazon is the same river where Corporal Eviatal Yosefi drowned last week during a tragic training accident. Rescuers in this case were thankfully able to get the victims safely out of their vehicles and police have already blocked off the area to prevent additional issues. Similarly, due to the flooding, police have also blocked off Route 90, both on the way to and from Tiberias. Then, nearby in the northern village of Araba, 
firefighters and other emergency rescuers responded to dozens of calls for assistance, even saving a mother and her son from their flooded home. All this comes as record snowfall hits Mount Hermon and Jerusalem as well, delighting some and overwhelming most others. In fact, the snow reached a depth of 15 centimeters in the Hermon just this week. Finally, even though tomorrow's forecast looks pretty clear, we aren't out of the woods just yet. Meteorologists predict that the rest of the week will still be characterized by additional thunderstorms, rains, hail and snow. Arriving on the world stage last week in Las Vegas, the Coral Manta Smart Drowning Detection System is making major waves in the AI and emergency response communities. Being hailed as the first of its kind, the Coromanta is a solar-powered device that you install at the corner of your pool. Once there, it operates 24-7 using artificial intelligence and a real-time video feed to catch drowning or other dangerous situations. It then alerts people in the area and sends an alert via smartphones. Founded in 2015 by Eyal Golan and Tamar Avraham, the coral system is named for 11-year-old Coral Sherry, who drowned with her friend Ol Koren a few years earlier. And according to the Israeli startup, the coral manta detects and alarms you to when people sink, meaning seconds after the victim stops breathing. This allows for as much time as possible in getting to the victim and initiating rescue services like CPR. Additionally, the sensors work day or night in practically any conditions and learn the ins and outs of your pool. This minimizes the risk of false alarms to a nearly 0% chance. That being said, Coral Detection System stresses that it is still just an alert and it's not a replacement for adult supervision. Currently, the Coral Manta is priced at around $2,000, but it's a small price to pay for peace of mind. Speaking of getting soaked in the river, Christian pilgrims from Israel, the West Bank and abroad all gathered on the banks of the Jordan River on Sunday to celebrate Epiphany, or the annual commemoration of Jesus' baptism. Worshippers came together just a half hour's drive outside of Jerusalem at the Kasar al Yehud site where Jesus' baptism is believed to have occurred. And once there, visitors descended down some steps into the Jordan River to be baptized anew themselves. Then later, as the Epiphany, or the visit of the Magi, is also considered a feast day, the pilgrims will sing songs, have their homes blessed, eat three kings cake, and attend church services. Finally, as the Epiphany is also known as the Twelfth Night of Christmas, many Christians around the world will also customarily be removing their holiday decorations now. As prices on rental properties and hotel rooms in Israel continue to climb with the housing market, a new addition to the hospitality industry in the Jewish state has just opened its doors, and just in time for Eurovision 2019. Say hello to the Spot Hostel in Tel Aviv, the first capsule hotel in the Jewish state. Located just behind the Abu Lafia Bakery near North Tel Aviv's seaport, the Spot Hostel boasts 90 rooms in a range of sizes from a one-person capsule with a single bed and a shared bathroom to large family rooms that include lofts and pop-up couches. Prices on the variety of spaces also range in price, from $25 a night up to $145 a night for the larger accommodations. Additionally, at least 30 tents will be put up indoors on the second floor of the building for an alternative, intimate, and especially inexpensive stay. 24 of the tents will be sized for couples, and the remaining six will have bunk beds. But all 30 will have AC and television, and they'll be priced between $20 and $70 per night. Finally, while the concept of pod-like and small living quarters is borrowed from Japanese developments, not much else is. According to marketing and sales manager Namash Viki, the focus on this hostel, as it is in most others, will still be community. So the spot also offers large public hangout spaces, a lounge, complete breakfasts for overnight stays, and a large balcony space. And as if that wasn't enough, of course, the spot hostel also boasts weekly events, a public bar in the evenings, tours around the city, and more. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. As Christians this week celebrated the epiphany, or baptism of Jesus, today's word is hitgalut, meaning epiphany, or revelation. When you finally have a sudden insight or realization, that's a hitgalut, or epiphany, and both in real life and in literature, you can find many examples, like the hitgalut, or revelation, that we're stronger than we thought, and conversely, maybe the hitgalut, or revelation, that we need more help than we expected. Let us know about your latest hitgalut. Now, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight, you can expect scattered showers and a cool low of about 51 or 11 degrees Celsius. 
Then tomorrow should be sunny and with a rise in temperatures to a high of around 64 or 18 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.65 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Ladar Gervais Lazi. Thanks for watching.